<laughs> and it is blue. So we are going to click. And we are live. Welcome everyone. It's Wednesday, March 16th, 2022. It is 5.06 p.m. And we are here with Dr. Sarah Bond and hopefully Peter Keegan. And we are going to be talking about ancient graffiti today. So just as a little um, catch up for those of you who have not heard us uh, because we were only on Crowdcast initially, um, I became extremely interested in ancient graffiti. <laughs> so much so that I decided to make some of my own um, because of my trip to Ephesus when I was younger. And I am very curious to ask so many questions about this topic. Um, Sarah, what did, was your first impression of graffiti? Because mine was, of, as I shared with you, the um, directions to the brothel in Ephesus. Do you remember the first piece of ancient graffiti you saw and how that, that impacted you? Yes, I think that the first piece of graffiti that I saw was in Rome, in the Colosseum, and it was just a very small gladiatorial graffito, of which we have many, um, and people are rightfully excited to be at the games and to be attending a gladiatorial combat or some sort um, of engagement, and when you get excited, you do things uh, in the spur of the moment. And I think that graffiti is many things, but one thing is oftentimes it captures the effervescence of a moment. Um, not something that's been pre-prepared to be published oftentimes, although it can be, um, but it, it oftentimes is, is about people living in a moment and capturing it through writing, through the technology of writing. And so earlier, Ben was talking a little bit about literacy. And one thing that we've learned about graffiti over the years is that literacy exists on a spectrum. Um, and so people can engage in graffiti even if we aren't, if, if they aren't what we might today assess them as fully literate, that they can draw symbols, that they may know one or two words, um, that, that the repertoire of knowledge of writing can be very vast. And so it's really cool to see graffiti because we only think that perhaps um, maybe 10 to 15 percent, we don't fully know. There are lots of different numbers of how many people were literate in the ancient world, and yet graffiti gives us a broader spectrum of all different types of people engaging in conversation. And so, yeah, the Colosseum was the first time that I really saw graffiti in that light, and I believe that I was 16 with my Latin class from Roanoke, Virginia, so Patrick <laughs> Henry High School, Patrick Henry Patriots, uh, those, are, those are my people. <laughs> I love that. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, there is a very egalitarian sense to, I guess, ancient graffiti. I mean, maybe, maybe that has carried over to today because we, but there is, there still seems to be, I think, a hierarchical, hierarchical distinction between like graffiti, which we will ultimately claim as art versus graffiti. That's just like the scribblings that we find because a very bored child in their third grade class decided to sketch into the desk. But how, how do, as a historian, do you make the distinction about what's relevant or is it all relevant? Because as you said, it shares like a snapshot of a certain cast or group. Well, everyone has a different reason, a different motivation behind writing, just like we do today. So you can have a politician who pays somebody to draw what we call depenti, and depenti are just painted graffiti on walls uh, that, that oftentimes um, could be about a politician that's running for office or somebody who is throwing games for the gladiatorial arena. Um, or you may have somebody who is an enslaved individual who has fallen in love and they want to write in meter um, or they want to quote uh, Homer, which we have many metered poems. So I, I think one thing that I have been trying to get away from is thinking less about these ideas of highbrow and lowbrow because, first of all, I don't like the terms highbrow and lowbrow because, as I've said many times, it's related back to this 19th century ideology of phrenology, this idea that people with large foreheads are smarter. Um, and so I don't believe in high and lowbrow culture, and I don't believe in high and lowbrow 
graffiti, um, that all of it is valuable for reconstructing lived experience. And that's really what we are trying to do here is not to classify something in meter as high um, and something that is talking about defecating on the street because you hate your neighbor. <laughs> Very common graffito topic. Of, really? Of, oh, yeah. Lots of... Um, Lots, lots of uh, scatological humor uh, about shitting on people and uh, many, <laughs> many other things, uh, many curses, uh, many, you know, um, F you essentially. Uh, so I'm not in the habit of, of creating a typology of high and low because I think then we are perpetuating kind of classist ideas and, and putting that on antiquity as well. And so I want to hear as much from somebody who is a prostitute in a brothel, as I do from the Emperor Nero. Um, that That's kind of, for me, uh, what I love about graffiti is it allows a democratization of communication. Do you find that there's an equal amount of graffiti from both genders in antiquity? Or is it, or is it primarily a, a male um, in, uh, represent, or primarily a male perspective that's represented? Uh, we have more exact numbers that Peter can give us on percentages, but we hear from both men and women. And uh, that's one of the beautiful things is that when you talk to people about the ancient world, really the only ancient female author that most people can recite um, is Sappho. And, and it goes back to Sappho a hundred million times. And <laughs> yet we have so many female authors writing in Greek and Latin, Coptic, Aramaic, many other um, languages and we have women who are speaking to other women. We have women who are speaking to men that they love. They're writing in meter. We have, for instance, um, in Egypt, we have uh, two. They're called the Colossi of Memnon. Um, and once you hear Memnon in the morning, you write down a little notation on the actual statue itself. Um, and we have tons of inscriptions of women, um, especially in the second century, who are writing and writing poetry. And so graffiti really is a way to hear women and to hear people from what we might call marginalized groups of people. So yeah, I, I don't know the exact percentage off the top of my head, but so much more representation of, of women um, than we get either in epitaphs or in literature too. Even though we do, have, we do have a fair amount of Latin and Greek literature written by women, they're just more fragmentary. So I, I wanna ask more. Um, where, are there more common places to see ancient graffiti? Because I know, I mean, you walk down the city streets today and you'll see it on the the door fronts. Um, and what makes the distinction, uh, let's answer that question first. I, I always do these compound questions and I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, it's all over. One of the things that, that Peter, I'm sure will talk a little bit more about is that our attitudes towards graffiti are very different than those in antiquity. In antiquity, um, it was not something that was seen as taboo to write in the peristyle of a house or to write in an atrium or to, to write on various columns. We see it as taboo to quote, quote unquote desecrate a column or a statue um, or uh, to, to write on something as something that mars it. Whereas that's a, a modern taboo rather than something that we see a lot of evidence for in antiquity. There are sacred spaces where you should not be writing, but for the most part, you can think of the ancient city as a much more available chalkboard than hmm. today. It's something that people spoke to each other. We have lots of graffiti where people are in dialogue and in conversation back and forth, just like a bathroom stall, um, but in very public sections of a house or, or the city. So I think we do have to get away from this idea that graffiti is illicit and mm -hmm. clandestine. And it's not that it's never that in antiquity, but it's much more accepted as a, a public procedure and something that was going to happen to a building when you put it up. <laughs> do you kind of think that that's so this is so fascinating to me because I always think of little markets that associate themselves with also like norms and mores. And so you have graffiti, which was part of just culture and essentially like 
public tw- the public sphere and the public Twitter space and how people communicate it. But then you also have, as you mentioned, like politicians and marketing pitches that come in through graffiti. And is that is that privatization of marketing and that becoming like its own industry something that we think could possibly have contributed to this distaste for just okay, fee people. Oh. Bef- I think. I have Peter, uh, at least in disembodied audio form. Peter, can you hear me? I certainly can. And Yay! can you guys hear Peter? Yes, we can. All right, welcome. We have the whole group now. Uh, uh, tech liches being part of the show. I have kept one ear on the conversation. Uh, GDF, uh, it's all yours. Oh, I just I just keep peppering away. But I would love to hear a little bit about if you guys think that the creation of a marketing industry or 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 a sales industry or how print influenced our aversion to graffiti in public spaces. So I suppose that um, I could. Um, oh, there's a bit of feedback for you. One of the things I could say about uh, that interface is that uh, ancient graffiti is coming to us from an oral literate society. And as a consequence, what we would regard as newspaper communication today was very much what you found on the walls, on the columns, on the thresholds, on the temples, wherever anyone could inscribe a message and for that message to be seen. So I've been trying to understand how we can explain ancient graffiti in modern terms. And I suppose I've been moving from the Facebook wall to the blog, and I suppose even a kind of um, verbal podcast, if you like. So Peter, uh... If you could keep your yourself muted what when you're not speaking, that would be helpful. Absolutely. So I'm actually gonna keep myself muted because this is uh, gonna get out of control. Now, I think all of these are are wonderful points that we can really look at and and start to understand that um, there was a a new book that came out just recently about how uh, postcards were the first ever social network. And I think every ancient historian who sees this new book, not that it's it's probably amazing. I'm not here to bash it. All I'm saying is... uh, there were social networks in many varying forms in the ancient world that we have to look back at um, and understand that uh, there were letter carriers, there were people who were going to the same area to look at graffiti every single day and interacting with them in what we might consider um, today a modern social network that is very important to to understand. But I think to your point that we see a lot of advertising um, mixed in with personal missives. So it's not as though graffiti is just the purview of business or just the purview of of people who um, are in love and lovesick or just the purview of of people who want to scream about how frustrated they are about something. But it's an outlet in general. And that means means it's an outlet that can be capitalized in terms of commerce or an outlet that can be capitalized in terms of creating friendships and 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 speaking to people when you feel emotional about something um, or just talking uh, uh, about your day. And so I think one of the questions in the chat is talking a little bit about the materials and something that Peter has studied, and I don't want to speak for him, has studied extensively is about ephemeral graffiti and the fact that we have only a small portion of all of the things that people wrote and did because I can study game boards at the site of Philippi and think about the New Testament and think about Paul interacting with these game boards that are etched on the stones at Philippi. But I may not be able to see the charcoal ones. I may not be able to see all of the ones that are in many more ephemeral materials that washed away, right? Because all of us who have kids or were kids use chalk. 
for instance. And so Romans are oftentimes using charcoal to do um, many of this, which is very available in the ancient world. But if you just think about that, so many writings have just washed away with the sands of time. And it's really, it's sad, but but um, a lot of new technologies are allowing us to, to see walls in the ancient world as a palimpsest, as um, kind of layers of writing over time. Um, and so graffiti studies are, are not stagnant. They're constantly changing and they're constantly growing the number of writings from the ancient world that, that we have. And um, Peter has uh, a new article that looks at how we might be able to look at graffiti, for instance, in order to be able to reconstruct the world of the Bible. So it's not just the purview of um, people who consider themselves Pompeii historians or people who consider themselves Roman imperial historians. Graffiti applies to every sector of the ancient Mediterranean and, and far beyond. So I would love to hear more about this, Peter, especially because of the universality of the presence of graffiti across, as Sarah has mentioned, a multitude of ancient cultures. Absolutely. Uh, if you consider the fact that uh, everyone who could write um, wrote um, in terms of inscribing surfaces, uh, it was only much later in antiquity that we begin to find writing on surfaces other than walls or wax tablets or pottery sherds uh, and so consequently we must imagine that everyone who could write and who wished to communicate to those who could read uh, would use any available surface and what i've found which is uh, quite interesting in terms of our understanding of modern graffiti is that this was very much a social practice as sarah mentioned this is regarded as anti-social behavior today this is just simply a way of um, inscribing your own identity that you can write, that therefore you are literate, but also that you have something to say to a particular audience or to everyone. And as Sarah mentioned, you'll find these graffiti throughout the ancient world. And what is so exciting, as she also mentioned, is that many of these graffiti are still preserved. They were inscribed on surfaces which were once painted or lime washed or in other ways decorated and the inscriptions were very clearly seen at the time because they were just simply cutting into those painted surfaces. Now we can draw those out of those unpainted surfaces. We've lost the surface layers, but we can draw these out with photogrammetry and x-ray fluorescence and other techniques. Um, of course, one of the difficulties is that because there were only a limited number of surfaces, Quite often people overwrote on others. Um, you've probably heard of those wonderful uh, tablets, wooden tablets that have been found in Roman Britain. And uh, they preserve any number of informal messages to uh, soldiers, to wives, to family members. But because the tablets were the notebooks of the day, they were reused time and time again. And so you often find 10, 15, 20 layers of inscribed text, one on top of the other, on top of the other. So while we can still draw out these messages, it's not necessarily an easy process. And I'm not sure if I have quite the patience to work through 10 or 15 or 20 <laughs> layers, but nevertheless, I'm very interested in what we can find on those closer surfaces. Now, Peter, is there any subject matter on those tablets that has really surprised you, that you were surprised to find as part of graffiti? Because it sounds so much like there it, it covers almost every human topic. I don't know whether I was surprised so much as in terms of what we have been told by the scholarship for, for many decades. Um, literacy was a male preserve, and uh, I think Sarah also mentioned that, and you asked the question, can we actually uh, define a, a gendered component to uh, inscriptions? And I found more and more that women were inscribing as much as men. It's just difficult to determine who they were, what social level they came from, but they are most definitely women and they're writing to other women. They're talking about men and other women. And 
and they're, they're writing about all of those topics which you would expect men and women to write about. Uh, it's not something that's uh, limited to gender exclusive topics, it's uh, across the board. And uh, I suppose the one thing I was surprised to see in Pompeii, in one of those brothel graffiti that you uh, referred to, um, was a reference to uh, a group of women who uh, labelled themselves as followers of Nero. Hmm. And uh, we do know about Nero that uh, he had a propensity to uh, enjoy the limelight. And we also have heard the scurrilous rumours that he, in fact, uh, employed thousands of people to attend his public performances and applaud him uh, in a variety of ways. And they were named certain things. And it's quite delightful that a prostitute, all prostitutes in the brothels, female prostitutes, uh, identified themselves as one of those particular groups, um, which kind of also tells us a little bit about the fact that perhaps we should be finding or relocating women in places that we wouldn't normally expect to find them in theatrical performances, uh, even those given by the emperor. That is so interesting. Um, I, I love hearing about this. Um, one of the other things that I was kind of curious to hear about in terms of content, and you had mentioned that sometimes it's hard to decipher what level of literacy each person has and if that is corresponding to a specific group. What do you look for? I mean, I know that if I look at text messages today from m my sister-in-law versus my brother, my sister-in-law will pepper it with emojis and, and my brother is emoji stark. There is not an emoji to be found. We're lucky if the punctuation is there. <laughs> so are, what kind of clues do you look for in trying to decipher gender or trying to decipher um, class or education? I suppose uh, the language in which the uh, graffiti is written, um, and so uh, whether Latin or Greek or any of the languages that were used in the ancient world, um, you look to see how they are constructed. One of the one of the irritating things about early studies of inscriptions in places like Pompeii and Ostia and Rome and and anywhere in the ancient world is that if the Latin wasn't up to Ciceronian standards, then it wasn't really worth reading or talking about. And so quite often uh, the level of language that is used is what uh, scholars of a certain um, age would have described as non-Ciceronian and therefore as vulgar Latin or vulgar Greek, very coarse. Um, by the same token, we can see in certain inscriptions, in certain graffiti, that those who are composing the graffiti are working with the language as they understand it and either striving to reach a certain standard or simply communicating at their own level. And so we can, we can certainly determine um, which particular social level within reason uh, a graffito has been uh, composed. Um, but uh, it's certainly not exclusive to the upper classes, the, uh, the well-educated, if you like. Um, one of the rumours about the uh, graffiti of Pompeii was, was that there were gangs of schoolboys rushing around Pompeii, composing all the graffiti that we find there because it couldn't possibly be anyone else. And while we do know that there are children who are inscribing in various ways on the walls of Pompeii and other places, um, it's certainly not the case that it was just educated male school children who were uh, doing these kinds of things. So we have a question from Ben. Um, he asks, what about non-Roman graffiti? Presumably the instinct to write on walls is a universal one. Oh, absolutely. Um, we can go as far back as we want. I mean, if you're really looking for ancient graffiti, then you go to the petroglyphs in uh, Europe uh, or in any uh, ancient land. Um, First Nations people in Australia, for example, were inscribing messages on uh, cave walls and other hidden places uh, in the uh, Australian uh, landscape um, 60,000 years ago. So we can go way back. As, as long as there has been communication in some kind of language, 
you'll find a message or messages written in that language which speaks in no certain terms about what was important to the person writing that. Um, so we find uh, particularly uh, large repositories of graffiti um, in Europe, scattered throughout Europe, um, and certainly in terms of what we would talk about as the classical age, it stretches from the archaic period through until late antiquity and, of course, beyond. Mm. When we're categorizing graffiti, I just thought of this because it, of, of what we were just speaking about, like would the Nazca lines be considered graffiti or would that be considered something else? Because w at what point do we d designate it as graffiti and when is it something else? That's a vexed question. Um, scholars have been uh, uh, categorizing uh, all aspects of their disciplines for, for, for as long as there's been scholarship. And so uh, graffiti has been categorised in a very particular way. Um, we would describe graffiti as something which is not intended to be preserved, uh, something which is uh, inscribed on a surface, uh, a durable surface of some kind, but in some ephemeral um, way. So the idea would be that there is a message which is to be seen for a certain length of time, but it was certainly not intended to remain. And so everything that we have preserved to us now certainly was intended to have survived to this particular period of history. Um, and so graffiti would be described in that way. And so you can find it, as I mentioned, on pottery shirts, uh, artists in the Egyptian deserts who were working on the uh, uh, tombs of the, the great pharaohs. Uh, those artists were inscribing messages to each other writing receipts for particular um, uh, goods or services that they had provided. Um, pottery was one of the, the key ways of communicating and so we would describe those as graffiti, very ephemeral, the kind of daily message that you just scratch on a, a fridge fridge door and, you know, this is what we're going to buy today or this is what we need. Um, and so, so something that's meant to last, that moves into the area of uh, inscription, if you like, epigraphy, uh, which is a more formal kind of inscription. Sarah, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Because I, I, I saw your little note in the uh, chat. I'd love to hear more. Oh, sure. I mean, I, uh, I, I am just here to, again, amplify everything that, that Peter says, but I've worked a lot with the catacombs and one thing that is amazing is just to see that any available surface, even within the purview of areas for the deceased, that people feel very compelled to do graffito. So one that I put up on Twitter the other week um, is a phoenix. Does everyone see oh, the wow. Christian phoenix here? Yeah, and it's not just <laughs> Harry Potter um, using the phoenix as a symbol. Early Christians saw the phoenix as a symbol of resurrection. Um, and so we see graffiti and we oftentimes write graffiti off as not being serious, um, as something that uh, is, is just tossed away. But religion and whether this is, um, there is a wonderful book on Jewish graffiti in antiquity um, and, and there are many Christian graffiti, but also many that, that are just focused on traditional Greco-Roman religion as well. Um, it gives us insight into people's faith because we have people who are thinking about resurrection, who are thinking about the fact that their, that their father or mother just died. Um, but also we have grave diggers in the catacombs who are saying things like, I'm the fossor, that is to say, I'm the grave digger who interred the body of X or Y. And they have little symbols for the hammers that they use and the chisels and things like this. And so, you know, in a, in a world where representation is very limited, especially for laborers and, and for those seen as the 99%, and in actual numbers, this is something that's been reconstructed, that non-elites are almost exactly probably around 99%. Um, that is to say, below the decurial class and below veterans, um, that that we have uh, that we have people who are talking about their jobs and they're talking about what they're doing every day, and that gives us real insight into just the quotidian experience. And I think that one reason I love HBO Rome, which I bring up with you guys every time I'm on, is that the upstairs downstairs format 
which we see on Downton Abbey and we see on um, Below Deck Mediterranean and Below Deck Sailing Yacht, which both of which I watch. I love Upstairs Downstairs because we can see the elites, but then you contrast that with people who are non-elites and the graffiti is allowing us registers to really see different types of people, even though, as Peter noted, sometimes it can be very difficult to figure out the age of the people, et cetera. There was a, a misguided paper a number of years ago at a conference that I went to that wanted to see scribbles as children's graffiti in Pompeii. And it's very difficult unless they say, I'm a child of nine years old, um, to tell if this is a child or if this is an 80-year-old man. Um, so yeah, that, that can be difficult. But, but I just do love that we can see just daily life from grocery lists all the way to resurrection and an idea of the afterlife, all, all in these types of writings. You back on that. What Sarah was saying there about the upstairs downstairs nature of uh, graffiti um, in uh, ancient Rome uh, there is a great hill the Palatine Hill on which were built the imperial palaces and beneath those palaces uh, on the slopes of the Palatine were the slave familiar where all of the slaves who worked in those great imperial palaces were trained and eventually uh, lived and worked in the palaces and there's a wonderful cluster of uh, graffiti associated with one of these uh, familiar um, it's called the Pythagogium and there are a number of graffiti which we know would have been inscribed by uh, predominantly male slaves of uh, an age between 14 and 20 and we know that uh, they were very much a family as well as that very specific Roman term familia or household uh, because they write to each other of their concern for each other, uh, of, their, of their love for each other, um, as well as uh, snide remarks about their masters and mistresses. A glorious cluster of graffiti um, which includes um, one of the most famous uh, graffiti um, that connects again with uh, New Testament uh, graffiti, um, an image of a cross or crucifix and of what's clearly a, a slave-like figure um, crucified on that uh, cross, um, but with a donkey head. And there's a, a text that reads, Alex Amenos, worship your God. And it immediately conjures up the image of early Christianity in the heart of what we once called pagan Rome. And here we find it in the household of slaves, of imperial masters and mistresses who would, of course, eventually convert, as it were, to that religion and bring it to the world. Uh, quite, quite a wonderful uh, graffito and, and very much capturing that, that social divide and making those connections much more porous. That's Okay, so we have a couple more questions um, before we go to audience questions. Um, ben asks, does the value you both put on ancient graffiti make you think differently about modern graffiti? And I'd love to hear from both of you. So let's go with Peter first and then Sarah. Uh, I've really always enjoyed street art. Um, and I love the fact that it's now actually called street art. It wasn't always described in such a way. Um, and I really love uh, the mixture of, of wonderful aesthetic compositions on the wall, as well as what have been described as those more vulgar or, or very basic, or what people would describe as, well, that's just plain ugly. But why are they being inscribed or painted or stenciled or however they're put there? Why? That, that's always fascinated me. And it gives me inspiration about other ways of trying to convey how you feel about what's happening in your life, in your world. And we often find the most powerful messages about things which are really affecting people in a certain way, inscribed or painted or stenciled on walls. And so at this very moment, of course, there are terrible things happening in the world. And yet we find those kinds of messages appearing everywhere which speak to 
a collective consciousness as much as the individual concerns. So I, I've, I've always enjoyed graffiti. Mm -hmm. I've always enjoyed uh, coming across it, but uh, I've, I've taken on a whole new uh, love of what it's telling us about ourselves at this present time as much as what our ancient graffiti tells us about the past. That was, uh, you kind of uh, answered Ben's second question, should we be more careful about cleansing or washing walls? Um, and I thank you for that. Uh, Sarah, I'd love to hear from you and for both questions. Sure, I, I think that graffiti has changed really how the ancient graffiti has changed how I see modern graffiti in part because I worked with uh, a woman named Rebecca Benefiel who is at Washington Lee University and it's it's not far from you guys in DC but um, she has something called the ancient graffiti project and so one thing that's very important is that we understand graffiti in situ that is to say within the context and the spatial dynamics that they actually occurred. And so one thing about the Ancient Graffiti Project, which is in Herculaneum and Pompeii, is that it tries to recreate the actual location to it. Um, and so uh, I think understanding that these texts don't exist in a vacuum, they aren't just like, you know, floating around in books about graffiti, um, that they actually had an interaction that people looked at, that there was a gaze that people saw it um, and interacted with it was really important to me um, when I thought about, uh, especially when you're on a train and you see graffiti in tunnels, etc. that this is a way for people to be seen and to be represented through a medium of um, art and through a medium of writing writing that I think human, it, it tells you something about humanity in general, which is that we want to be seen um, and we want to be interacted with. So yeah, I, I think it, it changed the way that I thought about modern graffiti because I just was like, oh my God, there's so much graffiti in Termini Station in Rome, right? That it's all over. Um, and if you kind of think back and you try and, and think about it more as a way for people to interact and, and for people to come together. I don't think that it, it completely changes things um, today because you still want to have cleaner spaces, right? To, to have um, things free of graffiti, but it does give you perspective on uh, the human need to, to really be recognized. So that, that, that kind of does connect back and forth. But I have to say that Rebecca Benefiel and, and her work along with Peter um, has, has really been, because they wrote this book together, um, <laughs> has really changed a, a lot of the ways that, that I've thought about ancient graffiti and modern. So. I love that. All right, we're gonna go to our first audience question. Um, and I'm gonna ask the questioners, please direct your question to either uh, to either of our guests. So hold on, Richard, I'm going to pull you up. Hi, Hello. Richard, the floor Hello. is yours. Okay, um, so I'm, I'm curious, I guess either of you can answer this, but how old is the study of graffiti and how has it changed our understanding of life in ancient Rome? I mean, like, what did we learn that uh, may have um, overturned some other things that we thought and um, and uh, prompted revisions of what we what we know and uh, just how has the field developed i guess from the early earliest stages i suppose the uh, study of epigraphy more broadly really kicked off in the 18th century and uh, i do know that uh, in 1752 um, some lovely graffiti from the basilica of pompeii were uh, very fortuitously cut away and taken to uh, the Museum of Naples, where they are still preserved. And from, I think, that particular moment, certainly in Pompeii, graffiti were being looked at in a different way. Um, I've had the privilege of visiting the uh, labyrinthine storerooms of that museum in Naples, and there are those sections of wall and you break out the uh, official feather duster and brush away all the dust and plaster that's uh, accreted to those walls and you find all these wonderful messages. The, the, the actual uh, scholarly study of graffiti, I think, came a little later. As I say, once those prejudices about the level of languages being used were overcome. Mm 
apologies, I had forgotten I muted myself. Um, our next question comes from Ducks with Pants. Yeah, I was just wondering if there are instances that, of ancient graffiti that corroborate historical events or information about historical figures. Absolutely. Um, I think that uh, while they haven't survived, if you read any of the historical or literary texts, you'll find hundreds of references to historical events which would have been at the time written about as graffiti. Um, we read, for example, about um, uh, the terrible uh, times that uh, uh, occurred in second century Rome and the, uh, the difficulties that the Gracchi brothers suffered. And we hear um, uh, from uh, literary sources writing about that history, precisely what was going on, what was being said, and people who loved these guys um, calling for them to do what they, they could to, to look after them. Um, in terms of modern uh, or more modern uh, surviving graffiti um, of ancient historical events, yes, we could we could go through uh, ancient Egyptian graffiti, which speak um, in months and years about certain uh, pharaonic events, religious rituals. Um, if we go to uh, Turkey or Greece or, or, or Italy, um, anywhere in the ancient world uh, where people lived and wrote, uh, you will find references, um, again, to uh, uh, important individuals, but also to daily events that we may not be familiar with because they're not recorded in the histories. Okay. Gabriella, I'm going to pull you up. Okay. Uh, give me one second. Hi, Gabriella. Hi. Please ask your question. You? Hi, Sarah. Um, I guess I was just, I mean, you may have answered it already. Um, I was just thinking that in the sense that maybe humans, so there's background noise, uh, have communicated. We've had, since humans have existed, I always assumed there was some form of communication. And when people discuss literacy um, or illiteracy, uh, does that even make sense in the context of perhaps a time when there was only 10% literacy in, in um, the Roman Empire. I'm not sure if that's accurate. Um, so, uh, and if hieroglyphics were a form of language or of writing, you know, and communication, um, can we even speak of graffiti as illiterate? That's all. Thank you. Well, I, I think this is something that we were talking about earlier that is it's a form of a, a huge area of study that um, people like Mary Beard ha have also written on is that um, we don't understand literacy now as a binary. I, it's not one or the other. I can read, I can't read. Um, but rather, it's more like a spectrum of percentages. And so um, if we think of 100% literacy as um, being able to write in dactylic hexameter, which I can't, then maybe I'm like 98%, right? Um, and that everybody has a different percentage that they are. And so thinking about iconography, like say the crucifix within Christianity, um, and thinking about various symbols that were very important in the ancient world, we have a, a very interesting graffito that occurs almost across the Mediterranean called the Sator Square. Um, and I'll, I'll post it up in a minute, but um, it's an acrostic and, and it's also a panogram, uh, I believe. And so um, we have it at Pompeii, we have it Duro Europas, we have it all over because you can memorize some of these things and then in inscribe it or paint it on a wall because it's wordplay um, and it's because writing is a visual medium and so who's to say that this person is 100% literate that wrote the Sator Square or that they're illiterate, um, that it that it exists on, on various levels because people may know just a few words, they may know enough words to be able to write their name um, and they may not be able to put together whole sentences. My toddler, which I'm going to go get after this, mm -hmm. um, you know, she's just starting to put together sentences and she can't read, but she can recognize colors and symbols. And so everybody has different literacy rates. And so when people like Mary Beard um, and, uh, and, and others who study literacy say 10 to 15 percent, they're talking about what Peter mentioned earlier, which is like, can you write Ciceronian Latin? 
Um, and that is that is next level. I don't think that I approach that that number. So um, yes, I think you're exactly right that thinking about literacy as constantly evolving and constantly something that is dynamic is more um, important to understanding ancient graffiti than we may realize because we don't know um, oftentimes whether these people had, you know, papyrus rolls at home or a codex, or whether this is their primary form of, of writing that they interact with because you see laws that are presented visually and you may read them. You may read the calendar, which is presented in public, the FOSTI, but you may not have enough money, say, to buy um, a codex and you may have to go to the Rome's public libraries instead. So that's all a long-winded answer to say that Literacy, it comes in all forms. Um, and so uh, we have to be a very open minded about what that category means and careful about prescribing it. I love that answer. Um, I did want to ask one more question for myself before we go to our last question from our audience member. Have you guys noticed any, um, there was a couple of mentions about time within historic timelines, there are significant events like as we see today there's a lot of d disruption, a lot of war, and, and we find that people are expressing themselves or seeking to be understood. Is graffiti something we can look to to understand that there was a significant event um, by the number of graffiti, like the amount of graffiti we find? Or is that possibly just, it's more notable because we know the event happened and therefore we pay more attention to the graffiti? Chicken or the egg type thing. Um, Peter and then Sarah, please. I think absolutely. Uh, you find many clusters of graffiti which are speaking to a certain either local or regional or international event. Um, in any of the places where we found graffiti, we find these clusters, something has happened, one person inscribes a message, and immediately you begin to see a dialogue forming. It isn't obvious sometimes that this is an actual conversation taking place, but if you have sufficient survival of the graffiti, you can actually piece together those dialogues which are speaking about certain events. And so the, uh, the dreadful riot that happened in Pompeii, which uh, led to the shutting down of the entertainment industry in Pompeii and the neighbouring region for, well, it was going to be for 10 years, but uh, the ever-loved Nero uh, spoke to the fact that this perhaps was a little uh, uh, fierce and so they reinstated that but the event itself the riot which had caused this cataclysmic um, uh, impact on the entertainment of the people uh, was written about uh, at length by quite a number of individuals and quite sarcastically as well uh, there's one particular graffito which speaks about the fact that uh, we may have won the fight um, but uh, we still lost in the end and it actually refers to the riot which took place in the amphitheatre between Pompeians and neighbouring people, the Nucarians, um, and the Pompeians seemed to have won the day, but it, yeah, it ended their entertainment for an indeterminate period of time. So yes, there are clusters which speak to that historicity. historicity. Sarah, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, I think, <sighs> Having studied inscriptions, um, which epigraphy is is part of what we study when we study graffiti, but I study a lot more permanent inscriptions like epitaphs and laws that, that are put up um, publicly as well. When we think about the epigraphic landscape, we do have to be careful um, saying that there is a correlation between frequency and the trauma of an event, et cetera. Um, but when we see lots and lots of chatter about a certain event, we can say that this was important to people's lives. And so the number of graffiti that we have about gladiatorial fights, and who won and who lost and people coming day in and day out to keep a record of how many wins and how many losses can tell us about important events in personal lives, right? So we think about the Super Bowl Sunday and we think about um, the NBA playoffs. I'm currently watching a history of the Lakers on HBO, which is Adam McKay's new, um, new show, right? And so 
For me, um, there are big events that we can match up. Like uh, there's a graffito, um, a number of them that tell us this is this person is the enslaved person of Nero, etc. That we see enslaved persons to the imperial family. But for me, what I think is exciting is how important people believe sporting events. To be and so Peter's point about the riot in the amphitheater at Pompeii is very important because I want to say that after that there was a ban for a very short period of time on them being even allowed to do this um, to to have fights within the amphitheater for a short period and that is very similar to what we have in in Italy which is when you get into a fight in Italy between two soccer clubs between two football clubs you have to play in an empty stadium if there are riots afterwards so when I was living in Sicily there was a riot um, of the Rosaneri fans who are Palermo fans these are the pink and blacks and um, that means that they couldn't hold uh, fans in the amphitheater after that and so um, it may not be necessarily that it always uh, matches with the historical events that Tacitus or Livy tells us, but the frequency of these graffiti are telling us what's important in the day-to-day -day lives of, of people, which is to say things like gladiatorial fights, the price of food, inflation, things like this is, is what people are living and dealing with every single day. And so that I think that's also pretty cool to, to think about and to reconstruct as well. Okay, we have one more question mm -hmm. from Drew Rickett. Drew, the floor is yours. Hi, so I was wondering if either of you are aware of any efforts to utilize modern technologies like augmented reality to display historic graffito in its original locations. Yeah, I mentioned uh, Rebecca Benefield's project earlier, and there's another Pompeii uh, archaeologist whose name is Eric Paler. Um, Eric Paler, uh, Stephen Ellis, Sarah Levin Richardson, and Rebecca Benefiel, all of these individuals have been using um, RTI imaging. And this is just, uh, this is kind of very intensive imaging in order to try and get um, 3D images of graffiti and working alongside uh, digital humanists in order to try and recreate this. One thing that you have to be very careful about is if you tell people a graffito is in a certain place, some people, um, as Peter mentioned earlier, will go and try and dig out that graffito and pull the plaster away. So we have to be careful telling people exactly where some of the graffiti are, especially in Herculaneum, that the Soprantenza is very scared about people going and trying to remove the graffito and taking it home like a plaque. Um, and so there are a lot of protective uh, measures, but there are a, a lot of people that are, are working to try and reconstruct this. So the Ancient Graffiti Project, which has been um, funded by the NEH, is, is one of them. But also um, we see this going uh, into video games very well. And um, I think that we see graffiti throughout Athens in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And we're going to see more graffiti, I can tell you, because I've spoken with a lot of the developers of these games, um, that we're going to see more graffiti in more Assassin's Creed's to come and many of the, the ancient video games to come that are accurate to the actual site. And that's really exciting um, to see the, the, the geolocation of these graffiti moving into the purview of, of the video game world, too. That is amazing. I love that they're doing that. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we're going to leave it there for this afternoon's discussion about ancient graffiti. Peter and Sarah, thank you so much for being with us today. It was really wonderful to have you both on, and I enjoyed every single second of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Ben. I am back. Uh, I have never done that before. That was super fun. Um, <laughs> been a kind of electronic controller uh, 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 member of the Greek chorus. That was great fun. Um, we will be back not on Friday because neither Kate Klonick nor I can do Friday. We are doing tomorrow instead. So it we will be back <laughs> 
22 hours and 59 minutes from now. Don't be surprised when Kate tweets out the link for tomorrow. There's no show on Friday. There is a show on Thursday. Thanks very much to both of our guests, uh, particularly to Peter Keegan for being such a great sport about our technical difficulties. Uh, we made it happen. Uh, and thank you both for joining us. Uh, we'll be back 22 hours and 59 minutes from now. And until then, GDF? We don't have fun anymore, but we can scratch out something to leave a mark. I don't know. I'm trying to put way too many puns into a sentence. It's real bad. But we can, we, we can have graffiti. <laughs> thank you all.